um, a lifeguard wound up showing up with a box of band-aids and there were people laying on the ground looking like they had severe spinal issues. She isn't the only one agonizing over the lack of supplies. We've received multiple detailed accounts from witnesses. A British firefighter who happens to be staying there is working on Malcolm Johnson, who has severe injuries to his head and face. In his statement, Jeff Westwell writes he needed to find oxygen and an aspirator, adding, I looked in the first aid kit, but there wasn't one there. Hotel staff appeared with oxygen cylinders, but no regulators. They were panicking and, in my view, did not know how to use the rescue equipment. By about 9.45, ambulances finally make it past the guards, but something else is happening at the gate to the resort. A scuffle between hotel staff and reporters, but not just reporters. Police and the state's attorney general are being stopped from going in. That's him in the crowd, Francisco Alor. We were all stopped. I gave the instruction to get rid of the gate and proceed with the rescuing process. It was a very unfortunate situation with a lot of negligence. I could even hear on the radio the instructions of someone else in the hotel saying, stop everyone. The scene gets nasty. Journalists in particular chased by hotel staff, beaten with sticks and fire extinguishers. The Attorney General has to call in the Army to get past hotel security, and he is certain he knows why. It's my perception, without any question, that the hotel tried to take care more of its image than solving the serious problem it was facing. Choosing image over safety? A bold accusation, but the Attorney General is not the only one to suggest that. Paramedic Efrain Chuk Chan, who was there that day, says he's seen hotels react this way before. When we go to pick up a patient of any kind of situation, right at the entrance, we're told to turn off the siren and quietly enter the premises of the hotel. It's complicated, because when trying to save their image, lives can be lost. By mid-afternoon, Tara realizes all of the injured had been taken away by those long-awaited ambulances. Taken away from one problem, but sometimes right into another dark reality. Darlene Ferguson at the edge of the platinum lobby shields her grandson in the blast, but is gravely wounded. The ambulance that picks her up heads to the small, poorly equipped Sac Bay Clinic in Playa del Carmen, a mistake. Her injuries are too severe, so the clinic director gets in the ambulance with the family to move Darlene to Cancun an hour away. Outside the city, it runs out of gas. Paramedics fill up, and when they finally arrive at the hospital, this man, the clinic director, unusually, unexpectedly, asks Darlene Ferguson's desperate family for gas money, and then a little more, and more still. Is that a normal procedure to ask the family of a patient for money? We don't have money. But isn't that something that you could send a bill to an insurance company for later? I mean, her mother is dying and, and going into the hospital, and you ask her for money. I know, I know. But uh, maybe it is a, a big mistake for my part, but in this moment, we you don't have money. Darlene Ferguson does not survive. Neither does Malcolm Johnson or Elgin Barron or the two Mexican workers. By dusk, Tara has heard nothing. Then hotel reps signal for her to come into a room. She and 10-year-old Megan rush in thinking maybe there's good news. Only they're met by awkward silences. Finally, they said, well, people died. And I said, I, I know that. I was there. I know people died. But not my son and my husband, so where are they? And um, then one of the women piped up and said, well, just so you know, they're dead. And Megan lost it. Lost it. She bats away what she thinks is a sedative, but she cannot push away the reality. Chris and John Charmant are gone too. They had died instantly, but it's taken more than seven hours for her to find out. In the days and weeks that follow, while families agonize, the still beautiful, still popular hotel stays busy. So too do investigators trying to find out why this happened. The initial theory was that natural fumes from the mangrove swamps under the resort built up and ignited, but that's not the case. 
CBC has learned this is now considered the culprit. This is the first public look at a gas line ruptured ever so slightly in construction. From that rupture, gas slowly leaked into a space under the lobby until a spark set it off that morning. And as the Attorney General now reveals, that gas line extension to the Platinum Lobby was not in the hotel blueprints. Okay. The blueprints show the line officially ending well before it really did. Stop here, the line. Yeah, the line ends right there. Mm -hmm. Here is the problem, all right? That's where the explosion was. This is pool. So they didn't have permission to build it, to use it? No, no, no. Someone had installed that line without permission, and worse, this is a gas verification agency stamp confirming the blueprints as accurate. The date on the stamp is after the explosion and after investigators had already found the improper gas line and the hole in it. Expect four people to face criminal charges soon, the Attorney General says. Whoever is responsible has to go to jail because homicides and injuries occurred. Few are surprised by construction irregularities. The hotel had previously been fined for building on protected land and overbuilding. Several families complain of the silence from the hotel. A walk through the well-groomed, calm, full resort now shows the explosion site seems just another construction site. Remodelation reads the sign. Staff typically say the wing is just closed for repairs. Tell us that's all they're allowed to say. My, my boss say, hey, please, you're working here. No talk about it. Now, uh, very trouble. Have any trouble. For all that went wrong leading up to the explosion that November morning that killed seven people, and for the actions after the blast, it was time to ask the hotel to explain. We have an appointment with Zmaski and Nadine. An interview had been scheduled for nearly a week with the manager of the Grand Riviera Princess. Only something clearly was wrong. Stopped at the gate to receive a message, an assistant said they'd had to cancel because the manager was sick. Should we come back tomorrow morning? You don't think so? So she must be very ill. She is ill. It, miss, what about Mr. Nobosina Vargas at extension 4365? He is sick too. Thank you. Bye bye. And that was that. They're sick. Thank you, Emmanuel. No official statement, no rebooked interview. Certainly not the accountability for which Tara Charmant agonizes. Of course, they're sick. It's sick to leave your guests hanging like that. It's absolutely sick to not give them the dignity and the justice of at least showing your face, of at least saying, you know, yes, we take responsibility for this. How can we help you? That's what's sick. And to ignore it at this point and still offer no apology, no explanation and no chance of some kind of explanation? Yes, they're sick. It is bitterly cold in Drumheller, Alberta now. Colder still are those memories of Mexican heat. Of that time, not that long ago, when a young family believed some moments in the sun were just the rest, just the peace they needed. Adrian Arsenal, CBC News, Playa del Carmen. Mexico. In February, Mexican authorities issued arrest warrants for five resort employees. The charges range from negligent homicide to professional and technical misconduct. And that is News in Review. Don't forget to check out our website at newsinreview.cbclearning.ca. I'm Michael Serapio. Thanks for watching.